Yeah, you read the description right. Around these parts, I tend to put more emphasis on writers being more responsible people for the success or failure of a TV series, game, or movie with regards to its storytelling. That isn't always the case, though, and other issues may come up. Bad producers or other executive meddling can mandate what they want from a series, or veto the story decisions of a writer. A director can entirely undermine the intentions of a story. Production hang-ups can cause a story to need to be rewritten partway through or near the end of a make. Or even the authors themselves can become ill so others less suited can take over and mess things up. And all can cause all types of production issues that can screw with things along the way, which thus affects how an audience receives the final product. However, the reason I prioritize writers on this is often their role and contribution to making these materials is undermined or forgotten. As well, anyone can write? Not everyone can actually write well. And most people tend to focus on the hotshot director crafting the presentation but forget entirely that story and character is what most centrally matters to the success or failure of a series. And a director only ends up relevant in the discussion if they do that excellent a job and have very distinct tells and iconography, or in turn if they do that horrible job and can't even, oh, say, keep a camera stationary in a scene that's just of people standing around and talking. But a larger part of that is the recurring storytelling tells each in turn may possess that informs a writer's other works or at times serves as central thematic inspiration to later ones that they remix. The director is responsible for how the story is presented, not necessarily the story itself. And saying that they are the same is disingenuous at best, unless there's a co-writer or similar credit attached to the work. Avalon, also known as Gate to Avalon, is a 2001 Japanese sci-fi movie filmed in Poland, for dumb reasons, which was directed by Mamoru Oshii, and written by our old friend Kazunori Ito, about a seemingly dystopian future where many people's only means of truly living is by playing a forbidden full-dive immersion video game, which have had several of its players trapped inside of it. Hey, Ready Player One and Sword Art Online! Basically every other series that predates you with a similar premise called, and they want their gimmick back. Kazunor Ito, you may remember from my prior reviews, was the writer tapped by CyberConnect2 to craft the first era of the .hack franchise, consisting of .hack Sign, the IMOC game chronology of Infection, Mutation, Outbreak, and Quarantine, and .hack Liminality, and thus is considered the primary scribe for it since, well, he built the foundation of the lore for it alongside Tatsuya Hamazaki, the latter being who took over primary writing duties from him during the GU era of the franchise after Hamazaki contributed to the first era's side stories. And a year before that franchise got started with Dot Hack Sign, this movie written by him was released internationally. There are no such things as coincidences. And what's more if you'd sort of online fans' assertion that CyberConnect tried to rip off that series' creator when Dot Hack's writer was addressing this stuff literally years before him? And considering game development time takes longer than that, yeah, no, they had the stake up on this. And Ito's team up with Mamoru Oshii for this makes a lot of sense, as the two of them had known each other and worked together for years, both on the Pat Labor mecha anime franchise, and more prominently Oshii's crowning achievement of his career, the 1995 Ghost in the Shell film adaptation, an adaptation of the manga by the same name that also explored cyberpunk themes about people's consciousness being digitized and trapped in places other than their original bodies. And I am of the opinion, from Mamoru Oshii literally floundering in his productions whenever he wrote his own material, that had Kazunori Ito not written the script for him, then it would not have turned out the way people think it would have. As throughout the two's career, well, it was basically Ito that kept pulling him out of the fire. But this movie also acts as an example of what I'm talking about with how writers are lost in the process and deliberately ignored in promotion and discussion of media outside of novel form, with solely directors seeming to matter even when it is outside the purview of what they're centrally part of. As the Miramax DVD I managed to find, right at the top, from the director of Ghost in the Shell. And under the title, it's repeated that it's a Mamoroshi film, instead of it in any way acknowledging that it was by the same creative team as that movie, not just the director. And every analysis I looked up of this film focuses on what Oshi did what Oshi intended, how Oshi was visionary in depicting this. By the way, I have no idea if I'm pronouncing his name wrong. I have never heard it pronounced, so there we go. But all of them, all of them ignore how this story was not only also Kazunori Ito's writing work, despite his script adaptation being a large part of why the Ghost in the Shell film was as good as it was, 
but that it is consistent with the recurring motifs of Ito's work, his signature recurring story points, and how there is an entire franchise built off of utilizing these exact ideas in a more fleshed out manner that it directly informs the meaning of it, and fully 100% recontextualizes every bit of it as a consequence. Because all of the reviews I found only focused on half the equation, and that being solely on what the director did. It annoys me, and I'm not saying directors aren't important. Good directors are essential to realizing the writer's intended vision, but both jobs require unique skill sets to transfer something that is visualized in your head to being written onto a page in a way that others can grasp, and then taking what's on a page and being able to visualize it in reality. There are not that many people that can do both, and we really should work more to recognize the importance of writers as part of the whole process, because a lot of bad media gives off the impression that writers don't matter and are collectively disposable, the Transformers live-action films being an example of that. Anyways, yeah, that tangent is because, outside of its creative staff and some interviews with Mamoru Oshii, again, I do not know if I'm mispronouncing his name or not, I know nothing about this movie, nor could I find anything else on it than what was linked as part of its Wikipedia page. That it was a Japanese-Polish co-production is odd enough, as all the actors featured in this film are from Poland, and the film even was filmed in the towns of Warsaw and Maudlin Fortress. Again, if I'm mispronouncing that, I apologize. Primarily because those locations fit the atmosphere he wanted to achieve with the film, which were impossible anywhere else. Or rather, Oshi says it was impossible, and yet... There are architectural similarities with other locations in Japan if they did want to do it there, and he did similar movies in Japan without any problems later. Zero Dragon Blood infamously used the city of Kita Kyushu for their filming of events, and it had very distinct architecture from most Japanese cities sitting in their media, and the other Gar franchise entries used location shoots that approximate what Oshi did here. But because they didn't go abroad, they was only had far less expenses. My experiences with very live-action films going to film on location around the world is, well, it can end up being an excessive expense if you can't do so locally. Sometimes filmmakers are better off compromising if only to save on shipping everyone out on location to somewhere that might be unwelcoming. And the inability to do that is why this film actually ended up getting a Polish cast for the roles. You know, I keep looking at this in context of that backstory, and can't help but think of when Alexis sat me down to watch the JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Diamond is Unbreakable live-action movie. Because it did the exact same thing at the director's insistence, but also dragged an actual Japanese cast along to film it all in Spain that massively inflated its budget, so there's a reason why there's not a part two. From the interviews I found, apparently Oshi originally wanted to film it in either the UK or Ireland as well, as Oshi and Ito are both English bilingual, but found the Warsaw and Maudlin Fortress locations more appropriate for what he wanted to do. But unfortunately, none of the actors knew Japanese, causing difficulty in getting the actual directorial instructions across to the cast, which shows throughout the film, and resultantly requiring the film be overdubbed when it was imported back to Japan, and also when it was exported internationally leading to the film having four differing dubs. And the Miramax release unfortunately not only failing to credit the voice actors that were involved for the overdub, but failed to include the Japanese audio track, which is the most coherent depiction of the film. Moreover, the problem with Oshi as a director, as I've never reviewed any of his stuff before to mention it, is he is very much a visual storyteller, to the point that if the stories he's directing do not stop themselves to give exposition explicitly, you can end up lost with regards to what is going on as he lacks connective details between presented scenes and concepts for those who aren't paying attention. His means of visual storytelling is not, I will tell a story using only visual details. I mean in the sense of, I will use visual details out of context to anything else because the dialogue necessary to connect them was not provided. And unfortunately, dialogue and presented action need to complement one another, and doing both is not something Oshi does well. Thus being why he needs a dedicated writing partner that can permit those opportunities to showcase such. And as this movie is about people in a virtual reality game, that element of their virtual existence is given away by the characters appearing to at moments glitch out in pain, which is the part of visual storytelling that Oshi is good with. This is meant to represent the phenomena of lag, as by being plugged into a system like this, any disruption in how you perceive yourself is going to feed back into your real-world body in some way, shape, or form. 
But because of this, and the movie being in live action, it makes it far easier for the editors on order of the director to, say, cut out relevant dialogue that explains the setting we're being introduced to, which is less likely to happen in an animated one because, well, then you wasted large swaths of your budget animating something you didn't even use. And that purportedly happened with this film, where important dialogue necessary to understand what the hell is going on went missing for no explicable reason on Oshi's behalf, only for differing releases of the film, including the Japanese ones, to include additional subtitle tracks that provide the missing material and context that was, well, left on the cutting room floor. The English dub tracks took what the Japanese release did and expanded it, including an additional narration over scenes not present in the Polish, French, or Japanese audio versions of the film, so viewers wouldn't end up just completely lost with regards to what the plot was doing, or the mythological references the film makes that reference Arthurian lore, the name Avalon being a direct reference to that mythos being called upon. And while I have no evidence to support what I'm about to say, well, I think it might have been a turning point in the working relationship between the two, as after this movie, Ito and Oshi have not collaborated again to date, over 20 years later, when, before this film, they were all but attached to each other's hips with how much they were partners. Anyways, our movie begins with... setting setup text about how young kids retreat to playing war games online because reality sucks. Nah, screw that. I'm gonna join Jun Fukuyama's Rage Against State Oppression instead. How many people confuse that as a Code Geass joke instead of a Persona 5 joke? Yeah, about this. While online gaming of all sorts are ubiquitous today, y'all have to remember that the 1980s and 90s were outright insane with regards to how the internet and virtual reality were regarded. So much media like to treat video gaming with computer programs as either out and out evil despite it being entertainment, or the saying they'd have a player explore being real places you'd be transported to via the medium by which you'd interact with it. The Dodak franchise by comparison to most of these were among the most realistically grounded, and in part putting a satirical spin on that ridiculous interpretation of isekai fantasy due to how it spotlit the actual dangers and consequences of trapping someone in a game. And that was heavily in part due to how the IMOC and GU eras were crafted between Kazunori Ito and Tatsuya Hamazaki, to say nothing of how they were disturbingly on point with regards to their predictions of how online interactions and culture would evolve with time. A significant problem with the third era of the franchise, in turn, was how it abandoned that grounding it had it built upon to go straight for the I'm physically in the game! fantasy crap that had so kind of be despised as it thought cyberspace was a series of tubes someone could be sucked down into which led to another real place. And that's part of what made it lose its way, taking that trapping someone angle into something completely malicious as opposed to an unfortunate convergence of events. This you also see here rooted with Avalon, with the game called Avalon being used as an alternative to dealing with how bad real life is, as many feel they can't do anything to change the crumbling world. People in power won't listen, and the younger generation have become so disenfranchised because their voices have gone unheard and unlistened to for so long, they feel... what's even the point? So right from the opening of the film, the story makes itself instantly relatable to anyone who's lived through the last 20... 30... 40... years of the current bad timeline we exist in, where all of that is true for ourselves. But the game Avalon is popular enough that professional players can make a living in the game as long as they can survive it, with few people not playing it despite it being stated to be bad for them, and banned as illegal. The full dive tech the game uses is capable of leaving players of it brain dead, the victims of that state being referred to as unreturned. The phrase lost ones later coined to describe the same in dot .hack sounds much better. And why is the game called Avalon? Well, it's because that's where the souls of the greatest of heroes were kept away from the unwashed masses. First, plot point. Second, that's the throne of heroes in the Akashic Record. Avalon is just a secret island Arthur Pendragon's body was wished away to in order for it to not be desecrated. In some versions of the myth, it was also the sheath of Excalibur. In still others, that sheath was placed in a young boy who'd grow up to be a paramour to a Rule 63 King Arthur. But yes, witness now the power of Commodore 64 graphics with Atari Blast Processing! We transition to our first shots in Avalon, and yeah, this is definitely on the outskirts of Warsaw. The first stage of Avalon coming off as a military battle sim. The game, lagging, as the tanks are destroyed en masse, 
and we meet our protagonist, Ash. I am disappointed that they will neither use a chainsaw or an electric rodent to devastate something. And yeah, she comes into this invasion of militia into this European city, and the murder of NPCs that inhabit the region, and just straight up climbs on the tank and endears us all to her by killing these clear Nazi stand-ins. You're not ready for Class A yet. She tells off some of the other players that almost got themselves killed. The various players in black cloaks prepping for a raid on a stealth VTOL bomber, that's the final obstacle of this invasion event. Ash's narration going on about how the game's been going on forever and seems to have no end in sight. Completely unsubtle metaphor for how screwed up the world is? I mean, technically this was made before the US invaded Afghanistan. But this is what I was talking about when I said this is a predecessor to Dot .hack. Ash says the game seemingly has no goal to it, just a long death march between varied conflicts, so why stay there playing it if that is the case? Ideally, the setting for such material would be it would allow you to make your own fun, but with the entire game overrun by war events, there's just a limit before it all becomes pointless unless you create your own goal. And for Ash, it's trying to figure out if there actually is anything hidden within the game, in the same way the varying guilds of the Dot .hack franchise each did the same later on. Which likewise matches how Dothack's setting of the world is actually thematically representative of life itself. Sometimes it really is about the journey through life and the search for meaning that gives it meaning. Anyways, Ash takes out the bomber, clearing the event, as another player seems to be stalking her. She logs out, her entire full dive interface being something almost out of the Matrix with how it's set up, in an underground basement bathroom with her only wearing the slightest of clothing as protection. Again, The Matrix wasn't long before this was put into production, and there was a lot of aping of it for years afterwards. It makes sense that a story about a VR game would use it considering technically The Matrix is a VR game all of humanity is forced into playing. Also, once again, plot point. But as said, players get money for playing. For buying weapons with the assistance of a Game Master for the system. With it being revealed she's only a few missions away from the next purported stage of the game. She leaves, it's shown the VR gear is inside an entire illegal underground VR cafe, as the administrator of the system tries to insist she join a team. Ash not wanting to because 1. She had one in the past and they fell apart, and 2. The fact they want her to is in and of itself suspect, as it's easier to keep track of groups, whereas solo players can sneak into regions of the system they don't want them in. I mean, you could find new people to bond with and build them up to be as good if not better once their own personal strengths are accounted for. It'd take more time, but it would be safer. But that would require trusting other people, wouldn't it, Miss Protosaura? She heads home, and we see that the world around it is in a shambling state. I mean, everything is in these dark shades of black and yellow. It's as if instead of the blue or red pill, someone pulled out a yellow one. Like... I get what Oshi is doing here. It's to make the real Polish locations look more dingy and dated than they actually are, as they were trying to make a rustic setting look, well, in severe disrepair and dystopian. The game environment seeming to the players to have more life to it than reality, as that was a thing stories like this kept trying to do. But it makes it hard to actually make out details. Eh, what can we say? This ultimate next-gen full-dive RPG is even shittier than real life. Once again, plot point. She returns the next day, finding a replay with that bald stalker guy showing he cleared the same event faster than Ash did. Ash appearing to recognize him, only the system has no data on who actually cleared it. She tries asking the Game Master who he was, as it seemed like he was directly taunting her. What this and the following montage seems to showcase, though, is Ash's own enforced isolation from everything and everyone going to the game as it's an escape from reality, where she has nothing and no one but the game, and then avoiding all interactions with those inside the game atop of that. Now, I'm extremely introverted myself, and I've said many times that if I could spend the rest of my life as a shut-in, I'd actually be happy. But I'd be happy as I would be able to interact with people solely on my own terms when I wanted to. And I actually would want to, as then I wouldn't be forced into doing so. But not even introverts should be completely shut off from everyone else, as that is distinctly not healthy, and Ash clearly is not. Anyways, what I presume to be days after this, Ash runs into one of her former teammates, who calls himself Stunner, who treats her to... 
what I presume is lunch at what could possibly count as a soup kitchen in the future. Lamenting that he can't go solo like her. I'm a thief, and who the hell's ever heard of a solo thief, huh? I take it Sunner is not aware of the concept of adept rogues. Or for that matter... Smoke bomb! Again, ironic, as the usual protagonist of all the dot .hack games are thief-rogue-equivalent classes, as the following year, Kazunori Ito would engineer the character of Ryo, Sora the Betrayer, Misaki, as a solo assassin built twin blade, who would then go on to be the solo player Haseo the Terror of Death years later down the line. But there's a reason Stunner has been trying to find her. Their old teammate Murphy, who Ash had a thing for, has fallen into a coma and become one of the unreturned. What's left of his body hold up in one massive facility that caters to the brain dead. Facilities like this being why the game has become so reviled by the world powers, as it's draining their population away until it's barely standing. All the losses happening because each person here that made it into the Class A stage encountered what is best described as a sad ghost girl. No one knows what happens with her or what she is, as all who've had direct contact with her, well, end up like this. Well, yes, yeah, Skaith's on her trail, and Aura hasn't successfully transferred the Book of Twilight to give them the Twilight Bracelet. Well, that or Trige's Ida took Ina's body for a walk while Ovan was busy. Or as a third option, Morgana Mogan's really pissed at the people who happen to meet Lycoris. I could keep going on this, people. The rumors, however, tracked the girl down to existing in connection to the Special A class course a level which the player can't reset out of to save themselves if they screw up, which might be part of the problem. If a player doesn't reset to exit when they fail, they can end up like this regardless as their player avatar dies, causing their progress through the game to end entirely. The ghost girl could be causing this herself, or it could just be an aspect of the game being bugged beyond repair causing an automatic death to flag. And no one was able to make a bug report for the game makers about it, at least when they were still around, as no one knows who made the game anymore. Using her passkey, she tries to search the public system for any information connected to what happened to Murphy, using a series of search keywords. But the system administrators force her out, the only thing left connected being the term Nine Sisters, another Arthurian lore reference to the Nine Sorceresses who lived on the island of Avalon, one of whom among them was Morgan Le Fay. The keywords in turn give up a private meeting area with Team Nine Sisters that is just an ambush for them to try and steal her gear. She manages to take one of them hostage, then trading the real information she's after to find the ones they're named after, who are in fact the original programmers of the game. However, it turns out they were all hit by a lag, one of the assault helicopters that peppered the stage shooting through the numbers, forcing Ash to log out and show to us the debilitating effect that has on players to do that, which informs how they're being trained by the system to not do that. But why, though? However, the shock of doing so brings back bad memories for her from when she was part of Team Wizard, the team that never reset out of the game just to save their progress. And one of them doing so in their last fight together was what pushed them apart. Because the team were not friends. They were just the best gamers coming together to beat the longest odds. And any of them showing weakness eventually resulted in them tearing what they had together to pieces. However, as she heads home after resetting, she notices... Everyone's frozen. At most, she sees a dog move, but... Look at the image of the sky behind her. It's a green screen superimposition. And when she arrives home... Where is her own dog that never seems to leave the room? We hear it still being there, and yet when she turns around to feed it, where did it go? It's not in the room, despite us just hearing it being there. So, here's my theory on what's going on with this story, and it is one that is missed, as my starting spiel was going on about, because the people who have stated analysis of this film in the past have only had half the equation and only considered what Mamoru Oshii was purportedly doing, and never considered anything Kazunori Ito has been known for. For with context with Kazunori Ito's works with Dot .hack, it's a big tell to what this movie might be doing. I think everyone we've been seeing, they're all in an equivalent of The Matrix, trapped there by some power probably when the populace first tried the game, and this virtual world's version of Avalon 
is the designer's backdoor entrance and exit the system has booby-trapped to prevent people from getting out. The system itself has repurposed into making it so those trapped in there don't realize they are in a simulation. The city they're in when not in the game? That's just the main server they transition to the various game maps from, as we don't see anywhere else but that place. The unreturned then are people who have managed to escape the system, and thus their data bodies are left behind as a warning to those trying to escape to not do so, even as the system itself is slowly becoming more and more unstable as it breaks down, depicted by the worsening lighting and stagnant state of the simulated reality, which is lacking in life, color, and detail. This would then actually explain why the setting keeps referring to Avalon as an illegal game as the system itself doesn't want them trying to get out. And yet we see no efforts to crack down on those who run the game, or people who earn money from playing it, as it is their only way to earn money. Because those who control the virtual world can't get rid of it without compromising the masquerade. Which, again, would fit with the direction .hack would eventually be forced to take itself in, with regards to the idiot plot that is the Mama Conspiracy, that was trying to physically trap everyone everywhere inside a simulated reality, the conspiracy's architects would rule over with the assistance of an enslaved AI game master. And this is backed up somewhat by the story itself. The game master tells Ash that she brings stability to the system by being part of it, that the game would suffer if she were to be removed from it. Those lines in context with what happens later infers the idea that it's not a matter of her dying in the game, removing the value of people following her as a player, but her escaping from this digital trap will embolden others to do so, as they seek to find out what could possibly take down such a legendary player. Kazunari Ito's works have exploited this type of double talk a lot, with the antagonists of them all trying to control something that benefits them, but in the terms that the antagonists themselves are doing favors and helping the protagonists of the tale, when all they're doing is seeking to hinder them and their self-actualization for their own gain. Don't be distracted. Don't think for yourself. Only rely on me as your lifeline to get what you want. And it strangles out the individual from actually achieving their goals or independence as they're tricked into tying themselves to a malignant parasitic thing that wants to do nothing more than suck them dry over everything they have to offer. This was telling of the abusive control the dot .hack villains Morgana, Mode Gone, and Sakaki were depicted as utilizing. A key can open doors, or it can lock you in. And the story does back me up on this, for as she tries to find her dog, she hears the sound of the helicopters from Avalon's Class A stages that shouldn't exist out here. Unless, of course, those things are here as well because she's still locked in digital. Now, there is a flaw to this one could point out, which, again, is informed by how .hack executed its later take on this type of story. In .hack sign, the real world is depicted in muted color, almost grayscale grainy images. Similar how things are depicted here with the yellow filter washing out colors and detail, while the reality depicted in the World R1 was more vibrant and colorful. However, I feel this is a false precedent and not equivalent due to the themology of why it was that way in sign, which was then not utilized in any of the other anime adaptations to anywhere near the same degree, if at all meaning it wasn't a consistent themology for .hack's depiction of the real world at all. Sign used this depiction of the real world to emphasize how emotionally stifling reality felt for the characters involved in it, whereas when the cast were passing the time in the game world, they were more open to feeling like and being themselves with, well, less judgment, because they found companionship online that they couldn't off of it. But once they did, once they started to forge those real connections so they mattered as much offline, as a result, the real world was in turn depicted as happier and brighter. This most matters with regards to the symbolism present in the conclusion of the story, as when Sign's protagonist Tsukasa finally escapes from being trapped in the game and recovers her real self as An Shoji, does the color of the real world actively transition from washed out monotones into being as vibrant as the game was made to feel, as if the world now became a true place worthy of existing in. Avalon, however, does not have that. If that was how the story was trying to depict things, then at some point, the real world, where Ash would be when she and others are not actively going on missions, should be depicted at some point as not being this dingy. And that the 
Game World is only one step up in quality and not a truly aesthetically engaging, vibrant world tells you visually something is up with all that. Hell, even The Matrix, the movie The Matrix, did this in its own way with making the film's world inside The Matrix having a sanitized, unsettling feel to it that was absent to it in the dystopia layer. But if it weren't in this film, well, I may have issues with Mamoroshi as a writer as I don't feel he's a good one on his own, but when working with any other writer as their companion director, he far more understands how to present atmosphere to emphasize a point. And that point isn't, Ash's world isn't a place worth existing in as opposed to a war game, but more seems to be, something is up with this reality, but there's an active deception of what it is that those in it aren't aware of which more fits the film bring up a question about what reality one chooses to live in. Regardless, her distrust of the system gets Ash to try a low-tech means of research as the internet's blacklisted her, having to buy Japanese versions of books about the King Arthur mythos to try and get the details. Stunner coming into things again offering to help, for some reason. He informs her that he heard that a bishop, the quote-unquote magic class of the game, is always nearby when it happens. Tsukasa in IMOC, technically Hokuto in AI Buster, Muriel in Legend of the Twilight Bracelet technically counts, Ida affected Aina, attaching herself to Sakubo, and hell, Aina herself being used as a conduit to speaking with Orange U. Yeah, technically, that all checks out. Thing is, it won't work with any bishop. That would be silly. It's the high level ones that are most likely to have the encounter. And then we get multiple minutes of Mamoru Oshi zooming in on Stunner, eating with his fucking hands food that is meant to be eaten with a fork. Just, just, why? Why? That's disgusting. I don't want to watch other people eating any more than I want people watching me eat. I get the feeling that the disgust was deliberate, as when Ash and Stunner met before and got food, Ash barely ate and had the same expression on her face as he did the same freaking thing. When our food is boxed for takeout, I really think this is implying she's disgusted by the sight of people eating and takes all her food to be prepared and eaten in private, if she eats at all. But yeah, that's the next step in this, either finding a bishop or class change into a bishop, at the cost of a lot of experience and in-game points, which would mean Ash's entire playstyle would be screwed, unless she had a team to compensate for her level reset. At home, the stalker from the beginning who was in the game has found her well, here, and points out the world inconsistencies. We haven't seen Ash eat. Most of the food she's cooked seem to go to her dog, and the books she just bought are all 100% completely blank. The ability to analyze data is one of the most important skills of a bishop. And from the second I heard him, I figured this guy was voiced by Steve Bloom. And asking on social media, yeah, he was. Like, I have zero idea who is doing the English dub voices for this movie. There are no voiceover credits that I could find anywhere for anything relating to it. And yes, I checked the movie credits first. Whoever was on the dub for this is uncredited, and I don't recognize Ash's voice actress. But the more I listened to Stunner, the more I thought he might be voiced by Richard Cancino, who also later confirmed that yes, it was. I also swear I know the voice of the Game Master, but I can't put a name to the voice. I even tried asking both of them on Twitter, thus how I learned that they actually were part of this, if they knew who voiced that guy in Ash, and yeah, because it's been 20 years, neither of them could tell me. This guy is high enough level to be able to do what Ash needs, offering to actually team up with others if it will allow her to the ghost girl. The woman who runs Ash's hub also seems to know of this guy, who is only known as the Bishop, revealing he has his own terminal separate from the hubs and that he has special access privileges that allow him to circumvent normal rules. She gets logged in and finds Bishop, finding he's already recruited a party, revealing to her that this Bishop is the successor to the Nine Sisters that created Avalon. Almost as if he's their... son. Great, we have a Mordred in the house. Bishop's goal in this is actually to recruit people out of Avalon, and to running it on an entirely new tier. That's why they led people to the Ghost Girl in the first place, to test them. His support crew? Nothing but NPC ciphers programmed to act like players. Which is the greater challenge? The sort of game that you think you can win, but can't? Or one that seems to be impossible, but isn't? 
Maintaining a precise, delicate balance somewhere in between. That's what keeps it going. Well, that and the story. The story is also very important. But then again, it's meant to be a metaphor about hope. Hope that you can succeed in your life. Which, again, the game is stringing along. Sunder's joining them in this assault as well, actually acting on Bishop's behalf as a recruiter to get her in on this, as Bishop truly thinks she's the one that he's been looking for. They raid one of the ruined regions, causing a... siege tower tank to be brought into existence? What is this I don't even? Fortunately, Ash is stealth spec, so she's able to get around to its back while the others provide a diversion at least until it starts transforming on them and firing all its guns on Bishop, who distorts himself and takes no damage? However, we see the real Matrix influence here, as the entire backside of the stage is just plain glitching out. She managed to get behind it and blow it up, completing one of the last missions of the game, but here's where they hit a bit of a snag when the ghost girl appears and Stummer proceeds to shoot it, not seeing that an enemy unit had suddenly respawned and shoots him. He tells Ash what's up with the girl, as he actually was in a previous group to encounter her and survived. All she needs to do is shoot the little girl to get to the missing stage. So now Ash chases the ghost through the system, trying to kill it, and for her to somehow be able to hear it through its attempts to be invisible, her shots opening up a warp gate, to the next stage. Well, that'd certainly be a twist if I hadn't guessed the plot of the movie again. I mean, I'm assuming I did, as no one has actively discussed this film since before rub reviewers even became a thing. Actually, we're not far off from that, as Bishop explains, as he's here too. Its design is far more sophisticated than any level of the game you've seen. Yeah, everything here isn't overtaken by just one massive yellow filter. And yeah, this is the last stage of the game. An unreturned player somehow got in here despite not being in a stable connection like Ash's. More half and half, and Bishop is tasking Ash with hunting them down and eliminating them. But look at how he's talking to her. Shouldn't he be able to come here himself if he has special permissions by the system? Or as I was theorizing, it is the Game Master taking a different form of another NPC the system is using as their face to trick players into completing challenges on their behalf. After all, Ash is an important part of the system, according to them. And where is the sole place the Game Master talks to the players? Why, in the terminal room with the players interfaced with it. In essence, you'll be acting as a debugger, removing a virus from the system before it can spread. Again, nothing in the actual film contradicts my theory about this. That this is the masquerade. The final stage of the game because it's the final trap, the last layer of deception keeping people contained. A matrix outside the matrix while still in the matrix that prevents the trap populace from escaping the matrix. The inevitability of its doom is apparent to me now as a consequence of the imperfection inherent in every human being. Thus I redesigned it, based on your history, to more accurately reflect the varying grotesqueries of your nature. Seriously, why do people not understand the architect scene? Because that is all what this seems like. The one Ash is hunting down is Murphy, who escaped without becoming a vegetable like the others. He is the only one to do this. Ash wants to follow after him wherever he's gone, and the system puts in motion a series of encounters that lead Ash to Clash Real, where she is given a gun and told not to use it on anyone else in Clash Real, or she'll lose. Though, if she wins, she's then offered the chance to have special permissions in shaping the game of Avalon, just as she's always wanted. But, what are the consequences of her losing in this stage? Does she become another unreturned? Or would alerting the people around by attacking them here drop the masquerade to reveal that she just got out and escaped a closed system? 
And what's more, I continue to think this because if Bishop designed Class Real and has permissions to come here, then why is he not here with her? Why does character model glitch out and be incapable of being damaged by that sage machine that should shred actual player characters, as did his data disposable data clones? The only reason that wouldn't work is because games like this are designed so NPCs can't be killed by under NPC enemies under normal circumstances. By how game mechanics work? It fits. And he can't come here without breaking the illusion that this is all a game they're trapped within, with this place the final failsafe to them escaping. Or alternatively, the actual real world she just can't distinguish from the game anymore. So she goes on the hunt, her body physically weak as she finds her apartment was in another hub. The other rooms all empty of players, even as it seems the entire place was set up as a medical ward for catatonic patients. Once more, Sword Art Online cannot help but rip Kazunori Ito off. She explores the region, with it once more being an actual color, and finds herself having panic attacks being surrounded by all these real people that don't even give her a second glance. It's overwhelming after being isolated for so long. But eventually... Yeah... She finds Murphy in attendance of an Avalon-themed concert at the Warsaw Philharmonic's Orchestra. They confront each other, Ash savaging him for seeming to tear up their team as he wanted to do more on his own and push past the boundaries of the game without bringing any of the rest along. He tore them apart because he figured out the way to get out. The rest of us were content being a team, but you weren't. You wanted to go all the way. We were just holding you back. But here's the tragedy of the film's doublespeak. If I'm right about what Ito was doing with this story, Ash doesn't realize she's out of the game, or in the boundary of getting out of the game. That this is the real world, or the last layer to getting to the real world, and she's been trapped by the system itself in a hollow shell. Her real body wasting away while Murphy got out and recovered. The system itself making it seem like the real him is vegetative, Look at him! He looks healthy. He looks like he's living his best life after having escaped a nightmare. Reality is only what we tell ourselves it is, that's all. I call it running away. But what if this world is where we really belong? Tell me, how do you explain what's happened to your hair? That streak of grey. How come it's disappeared? Could it be that it's only part of the game? We're not in the game now, Ash. And yet the tragedy is, she doesn't listen. The Game Master has offered her everything she seemed to want and made her believe the game is real life. Worst of all, his gun was empty. He tried to pull her free of the indoctrination, only to fail because she couldn't see beyond the twisted perspective of what she thought was the truth to actually escape from the trap. Thus, this triumphant ending with Ash getting the reward and goal she's long sought can be viewed as nothing but a tragedy, as she knowingly walks back down into the deeper levels of the game. Reality is what we choose to believe. As for who controls the game, I choose to believe it's me. Welcome to the world. This movie is very slow and methodical in its presentation, but do you see why I consider it Dot Hack Episode Zero? Because it is in every way that matters. Hell, even the slow pace of it makes sense, as it is trying to place us firmly in Ash's perspective as we're following her throughout these same small locations just as any player of the game would in their back and forth in their daily grind. Play a mission, lose their HP and stamina, head home, do mini games with the pet, see if there's any internal data you can look into, sleep to have your stamina restored, wash, rinse, repeat. If I am right about what the movie is doing, which again, no other film critic i found has even considered it, because why would they bother looking at an animated series in a game a lowly rider would work on when we could focus on the director of Ghost of the Shell, right? 
Even though, Kazunura Ito also wrote that acclaimed adaptation of Shiro Masamune's manga. But yeah, if I'm right about what the movie is doing and has done with Ash, it adds an entire new reading of the film and the nature of someone trapped by their own habits. The world isn't dystopian, it's normal. The only thing off about it is a woman whose vices make her unable to escape the trap she's pinned herself in, not realizing the absolute nothing she's been left with, with the only perceived escape being one long con to potentially make her an agent of the system, making sure others trapped within won't escape it themselves. And this does make sense in this malicious context. Who led her to the Nine Sisters team? The system did. What killed Team Nine Sisters? An NPC enemy controlled by the game. How was that attack hidden? Lag. But at no point did the signature static that preceded a time lag, as we had seen in previous scenes, was present there. The game just instantly spawned the enemy itself. What kept Ash from having backup, who could similarly be susceptible to Murphy's words from their shared experience? The game spawning one last enemy that should have died in the previous explosion when the rest of the level was cleared. Who led her to the encounter with the ghost girl? The game seeded the entire event, feeding her curiosity with a little bit of information after a little bit of information, as humans are themselves programmed to solve puzzles. Bishop having no information on him, just a title, is a tip-off to this too. Him being created by the Nine Sisters is a tip-off to this as him not being a real person, but part of the system. What reason does she have to trust a word he says, other than he's telling her exactly what she wants to hear, while at the same time mocking her as she doesn't see the signs around her for what they really are? Did you know that the first Matrix was designed to be a perfect human world where none suffered. It was a disaster. No one would accept the program. Entire crops were lost. I believe that as a species, human beings define their reality through misery and suffering. And this gels with what Avalon itself is in Arthurian lore. It is an island separated from existing as part of the world trapping those who live upon it there unless they are granted special permission from the Nine Sorceresses to come and go. And what did this tale's potential XP of Mordred do? He let someone off the island, where Avalon's endlessly battling heroes dwelled, in order to find someone that had escaped it themselves. However, I can't say that is absolutely, positively, 100% what the movie did. But if it was what Ito was going for, then it is backed up by what he did in his career immediately after this as something he has done. Thus would make sense for him to do it here. But I also get why some would have a problem stomaching that, as it would in turn make it so that Ash, the character we have followed the entire story, is in fact a protagonist villain duped by an AI system into committing atrocities against her fellow man by making sure they stay trapped within this system. That is a consequence of this interpretation and reading of the material. And you know what? I'm fine with that. Not every story needs to have a morally upstanding hero. Sometimes you need to showcase someone being outright despicable while remaining 100% within the character we have been presented, not to trick the audience and cast by appearing to be better. No, it's consistent throughout how they act, thus it's explicable why they then do things we ourselves might not. As the biggest reasons any viewer would have issue with that kind of twist is if it's not consistent with everything we've seen. This last minute twist is in line with who she is and her obsession, wanting to reach the unachieved goal in the game which the system leads her to, not realizing it's a goal that only exists because of another player's actions, which doesn't make sense if it was a goal before the other player escaped. Now there is one huge problem with that reading of the film, which, again, is otherwise consistent with Ito's works and everything seen in the film. And that problem is this film's sequels, which Cosnor Ito had nothing to do with. Yeah, this goes back to what I said earlier about directors are not by default writers, and how the role of a writer in the make of any media is regularly drowned out by people who think writing is easy and the directors is all that matters. It isn't. Not everyone can write out things in a stream of consciousness and end up with something that even remotely resembles something coherently understandable. And that is largely Oshi's problem. The man really cannot write to save his life, and yet with the exception to only one or two projects since then, he's written every project he's directed. The sequel to Avalon, 2009's Assault Girls, 
is a complete mess. It does away with all subtlety and mashes together the content of several other directorial works of Oshi's, not previously part of this setting. Fusing Avalon with the short film Assault Girl, Hinako the Kentucky, both of which were part of the short film collection Shin Ona Tachigushi Retsuden and Rebellion the Killing Isle, respectively. Assault Girls uses the setting of Avalon, which is the same MMO world where the real world looks like an FMB video game, and the game is by comparison more colorful. But any contextual reading of the setting of the game Avalon potentially being a prison for the players trapped inside it is completely lost. Mamoru Oshii himself has said he gets lost in the minute details of the story he directs and really remembers the grander cohesive picture to what their narratives are trying to say. So, with his complete 100% split from any collaboration with Kazunori Ito, who he had collaborated with for decades that led to his successful Kerbero Saga films and Pat Labor on top of Ghost in the Shell, his following films read like one long descent into incoherent madness. The fact that anyone can stomach such jumbled work just because they view Oshi as a good director, which, to be fair, he is, because as a writer, he just does not cut it. But it's not like I've got much more to say on the front of Kazunori Ito's works to contrast the two's careers. As this year, 2022, the 20th anniversary of the Dodak franchise and the celebrations around it, is also the 10th anniversary of the man who started it all, appearing to have retired. The last thing I have information on Ito writing is Dot Hack the movie Beyond the World. No, not the stupid mama conspiracy nonsense that was packed into Beyond the World's Blu-ray disc with Dot Hack Versus and the Thanatos Report, just the movie conclusion to the franchise that I really liked. Hell, he wasn't even around to help with Dot Hack G Reconnection, which, since Tatsuya Hamazaki was also absent from work on Reconnection, Probably more than anything explains why I still feel that story extension feels off and inconsistent with the prior three volumes. And if the man is still around and just doing his own thing, well, I honestly hope he's doing well for himself. As if you look at what he's written over the years, it's a small but very impressive library of works that all do mostly still hold up today. Going the distance with varied aspects of story and character, even if it is consistent with his very quirks. While he's not recognized as being as influential as many others, he is still important to the history of media in pushing forward the fronts of and building the foundations to how cyberpunk and VR isekai material is presented today. And following creators owe a lot to him for shaping how things have gone. And so when I found out about this movie, I really felt I needed to address that. But hey, in regards to this movie, well, I certainly recommend it. And due to the part it plays in the succession of Ito's career as it immediately preceded his work in the Dot Hack franchise, this is a film I will be leaving on my shelf of CyberConnect 2 related media. Because if nothing else, I feel it played a part in bringing about a franchise I so love. I'm Dash Shinta, and I'll see you all next time.